It says, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, the one who always was, who is, and who is still to come. Whenever the living beings give glory and honor and thanks to the one sitting on the throne, the one who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fall down and worship the one who lives forever and ever. And they lay their crowns before the throne and they say, You are worthy, O Lord our God, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created everything, and it is for your pleasure that they exist and were created. of the <clears throat> old hymns like at Calvary and Holy, Holy, Holy with the new hymns that are being written today. I just, uh, I hope you really, really notice, pay attention to the words yes. of these songs. A lot of times, you know, we sing a song often and we just almost get used to it and then sometimes we have a new song there's a little bit of a reaction sometimes, like, well, I don't know that song. Well, you didn't know that other one the first time you ever heard it either, you know. Uh, but, uh, boy, I just, I just marvel at the rich blessing in these songs that we sing Amen. here on Sunday. So thank you so much. Well, today we're in John chapter 2. We're going to be reading verse uh, 12 and following. 
Last week, we looked at Jesus doing a very private miracle. He was at a wedding feast, and he turned water into wine. That was done in a private setting. Today, we're looking at one being done in a very, very public setting. And uh, all four Gospels tell this story, but the synoptic Gospel, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, they tell the story at... Jesus doing this just at the very end of his ministry. In fact, it almost became the, uh, the reason that the Jews said, we've got to kill this man. John puts it at the very first of his ministry. But uh, So that makes some people wonder, did Jesus do this twice? And I believe he did. I believe that he started his ministry with this particular event, and then... Three years later, he comes back to Jerusalem and he does the same thing again. And uh, so we're gonna, you, you probably know what I'm talking about, but, but uh, some people believe that uh, it only happened once and John just changes and puts it a different place. No, I believe it actually happened twice. And uh, so in verse uh, 12, this is after the the wedding feast and it says that and Jesus went down to Capernaum with his mother and his brothers and his disciples they stayed there for a few days and then it says the Passover of the Jews was at hand and Jesus went up to Jerusalem you always go up to Jerusalem by the way no matter where you are whether you know we, we talk about going up north and down south but in Israel, up was always to Jerusalem. And if you lived in the south, you went up to Jerusalem. If you lived in the east, you went up to Jerusalem. If you lived in the west, you went up to Jerusalem. And if you lived in the north where Capernaum was, you went up to Jerusalem because Jerusalem was up. <laughs> it was a high place. So they always talk about going up to Jerusalem. And uh, so Jesus went up to Jerusalem and he went to the temple. And in the temple, he found those who were selling oxen and sheep and pigeons and the money changers were sitting there. And by the way, uh, I may explain this a little further later, but, but when people came, the Passover was a big deal. Still is today, by the way, for the Jewish people, and even for Christians, it's a big deal. But uh, the Passover was one of the times that everybody that could would come to Jerusalem to worship. Some, it's, uh, according to the historian Josephus, they said sometimes there were up to a million people in Jerusalem at Passover time. That's just almost astounding, almost uh, just imagine how crowded. And, and people would come from all places. And, of course, they couldn't bring their sacrifices with them. You know, you just didn't bring an ox or a, 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 a sheep or a lamb or something like that from 100 miles away. You would come to Jerusalem, and they had them for sale there in the court of the Gentiles. And so you could come, and you could... Uh, could buy a sheep or an ox or some pigeons or something like that. And, uh, but the only problem was that if you came from another place, you didn't have temple money. You didn't have Jewish money. And so they had money changers there, and they would say, well, I'll exchange your Syrian money for Jewish money, but I'll charge you uh, 20% to do that. And so they were gouging the people, uh, sometimes very poor people, and, and charging them to change their money and then selling them a sheep or an ox or some birds and charging high prices for it and then charging them to change their money to buy the high-priced animals. All that makes sense? Mm -hmm. And so Jesus comes to the temple and he's watching all this that's going on. 
This is early in his ministry. And he found people selling all these animals and birds and the money changers sitting there and making a whip of cords. He drove them all out of the temple with the sheep and the oxen and he poured out the coins of the money changers and he turned over their tables. Now this is not a picture of Jesus that we're accustomed to seeing any. We usually think of Jesus meek and mild. This is Jesus strong and wild. I mean, he is, he's really beside himself. He's actually angry. There's no doubt about it. He is incensed. It's what's happening here. And he, uh, he made him a whip. He, he took some cords and he planted them together. And he just sits over there watching what's going on. All this time he's making this whip. And then he just stands up. And he said, get out of here! And he begins to just thrash about with this whip. And he comes over and turns over the table. Money going everywhere. And the sheep and the oxen. He's opening their pens. And they're all running out and getting away. And the birds flying off. Yeah. Woo! That's Jesus. Meek and mild. No. That's Jesus angry. That's Jesus demonstrating a side of him that we're not accustomed to. And by the way, we have to be careful today. There's so much preaching about the love of God and the grace of God and the mercy of God. And all that's true. But there's a balancing side. There's a side of God that the Bible describes as the wrath of God. The Bible says that God is angry with the wicked all day long. And there, in our grace saturated, and I love grace, but in our grace saturated societies and churches, we have the idea that God just is going to let everybody go into heaven. You know, you go out on the street and ask a hundred people, do you think you'll go to heaven when you die? And 80 of those hundred, according to statistics, will say, I think I probably Amen. will. I think I will. But the truth is, most of them are not. Most of them are not going to go to heaven. Somebody asked a little boy, what, what do you have to do to go to heaven? He said, well, I guess you have to die. Well, that's part of it. But just dying doesn't get you into heaven, does it? No. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you'll be saved. Only. Repent of your sins and believe and you'll be saved. Amen. But if you don't repent, if you don't believe, you won't be saved. Amen. And there will be a day that you will experience, if you're not a Christian, you will experience the wrath of God. Right. Now there's a sense in which God's wrath is present even right now. Right. It's a whole different message, but, but there is a place of eternal wrath Amen. Right. that we don't even like to talk Amen. about. You know, somebody said that if, if the United States Congress could, they would outlaw hell as cruel and unusual punishment. Friend, I want to tell you something. God is holy. God is gracious. God does offer salvation. He sent His Son to die on a cross and the wrath of God actually was poured out on Jesus on that cross. Amen. And your sin and my sin demands the wrath of God. And our sins will either be pardoned at the cross or punished in hell. Amen. And we see this aspect of the wrath of God. And you, people say, yeah, but, what, what, but in Jesus, he's so kind and so loving. He is kind and loving. Even little children were drawn to Jesus. The worst sinners, uh, prostitutes and 
tax collectors uh, who were, were considered real outcasts in that day, lepers, they came to Jesus and they were welcomed by, by Jesus. Yes, he is a gracious and loving Savior. But to those who rejected him, the Bible says, we saw it in chapter 1, he came to his own, his own didn't acknowledge him. They rejected him, they refused him. Those that did receive him, he gave the right to be called the sons of God. But to those that didn't receive him, he was not nice. He called them hypocrites. He called them a brood of vipers. You dirty snakes. You devour widows' houses. You make a pretense. You pray all these flowery, beautiful prayers. And all the time, your heart is filthy. It says you, you're like cups that have been washed and clean on the outside, but you look inside and it's full of roaches and ants and dirt. Filthy. So you're like graves that have been whitewashed, but inside it's death and decay and stench. Jesus was not nice to those who refused to reckon with their sin and the holiness of God. Well, he poured out the coins of the money changers and he told those who sold the pigeons, take these things away. Do not make my father's house a house of trade. Mm -hmm. So this is a place of worship. Oh, this is a place where men meet with God. This is a place where people should come and feel the freedom to love God. And you've turned it into a business enterprise. You're using it to extort people and to make money and to take advantage of others. And his disciples remembered what was written in the prophet Isaiah. Zeal for your house has consumed me. So the Jews said to him, uh, what sign do you show us for doing these things? That's kind of weird, isn't it? Here, he, Jesus has just been whipping animals and running them out and unlocking pens and turning over money changers' tables. And the Jews gather around. After everything calms down, they say, uh, uh, what sign do you show us for doing these things? And Jesus said, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. And the Jews said, well, it's taken 46 years to build this temple. and You're going to raise it up in three days? But he was speaking about the temple of his own body. Amen. And when therefore he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this, and they believed the scripture and the word that Jesus had spoken. Now, let me just ask you a couple of questions. I've actually given a longer introduction than I meant to here, but uh, what, what, makes, what makes Jesus mad? Now, we know that there is a sinful kind of anger. Jesus was not sinfully angry here. There is a good anger. There are some things that ought to make us mad. And uh, something's wrong with the person that he never, never gets angry. But we ought to we have to be careful because anger is not always a sin, but anger is always an opportunity to sin. And Jesus didn't sin. He never sinned. And he was not sinfully angry here, but he was angry. And what was he angry about? Well, he's angry about hypocrisy. 
He's angry about people who teach one thing and preach one thing and say they believe one thing, but they turn around and practice something very different. Jesus does not like hypocrisy. And hypocrisy is a great problem. It is a, a great problem. And the Pharisees, this was the main word Jesus used for these Pharisees. He said, you hypocrites, you pretenders, you mask wearers, you, you, you hold up a face that looks pious and holy, but behind the mask, there's all this greed and all this sin. And he said, uh, in fact, some of the strongest language in the New Testament is Matthew 23, where Jesus pronounces seven woes, W-O-E-S, not W-O-A-H, not woo like woe to a horse, but woe to you, scribes, Pharisees, hypocrites. And uh, he says, you, you won't enter yourself and you won't allow other people to go into the kingdom of heaven. Mm -hmm. All through that whole chapter, chapter 23, just woe, 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 woe to you, scribes and Pharisees. The Pharisees were, were powerful people who abused helpless and weak people. And I want to tell you something. God hates power taking advantage of weakness. God hates when the rich abuse the poor and take advantage of the poor. That's why I tell men, you know, husbands, you are in your home you are to be the protector. You are the power person in your home. God has made the husband with broader shoulders and with strength, greater strength, in order that the husband can protect as well as provide for his wife. But when the protector becomes the abuser, when the one with power takes advantage of the weaker, the Bible actually calls the wife the weaker vessel. Now, I know a lot of women's livers don't like that language, and they say, oh, I'm not weak. I can whip my husband, you know. Well, maybe you can. I don't know. But, uh, but the way God set it up is that the husband is the one who is to be a covering, a protective covering over his whole family. Amen. He is to protect his wife and protect his children. And that's what's so radically wrong with child abuse and spousal abuse because the, the one who has the power is supposed to provide the protection. Amen. And when the one who has the power either neglects or doesn't, or when he actually becomes the aggressor and the abuser, God is angry Amen. about that. And that's what was happening here. People with power, religious power, financial power, were taking advantage of those who were weak. And Jesus was incensed. He was angry about religion focusing on money instead of the needs of people. Amen. You know, Christianity, there is one word that's supposed to characterize the Christian ministry and the Christian faith, and it's the word love. Love. Love is always seeking to give. It is never trying to get. It's never saying, what can you give to me? It's saying, how can I serve? How can I give? And a church, 
is placed in a community not to try to get from the community, but to give to the community. That's why I love our loads of love and other ministries that we have, our food pantry and others where we, we want to give to the community. And our, our goal is not to see how much we can get. You know, there are some churches that are very, very rich. They have lots of money. And I personally believe that wealthy churches situated in the midst of massive need are going to have to answer to God for why they had so much in the bank while there were so many needs all around them. There was one of the popes many years ago who was showing someone around the Vatican and he just made the statement. He said, uh, there was a time the church was poor, but said, no longer can we say silver and gold have I none because we've got plenty. And the person who was with him said, yes, but neither can you say, arise, take up your bed and walk. And I tell you, God does not want Christians to be hoarders of money. Amen. I'm not saying that we shouldn't have some logical, sensible savings plan and things like that. But rich Christians have a greater responsibility to give more away. And I know the American way of thinking is that if I make more, now I ought to spend more on me. The Christian ethic says, do not lay up for yourselves treasures here on earth. You'll lose all of that. But lay up for yourself treasures in heaven where you will not ever lose them. Moth and rust cannot destroy them and thieves can't steal them. And if that's true for us as individuals, it's certainly true for churches as well. And this, these Pharisees were greedy people. They had found that there was money to be made in religion. Listen to Luke chapter 16, verses 13 through 14. Luke 16, 13 through 14. Jesus talking about the Pharisees. No servant can serve two masters. He will hate one and love the other. He will be devoted to the one, despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. Amen. Money makes a great servant, but it makes a very poor master. Amen. And the Pharisees, who were lovers of money, heard all these things, and they ridiculed him. They loved their money. Look at Matthew chapter 23, verse 25. This is one of those passages I was speaking of, Matthew 23, 25. Woe to you, scribes, and Pharisees, hypocrites. You clean the outside of the cup and the plate, but inside they are full of greed and self-indulgence. He said, you Pharisees, you're greedy people. You're making money off of poor people. You are taking advantage of the poor. So many of these, quote, faith ministries, they are always appealing for money, making, making money off of the poorest people rather than meeting needs of the poor. Benny Hinn, went to Bulgaria, one of the poorest nations in Eastern Europe. And he charged money, charged, 
people had to buy tickets to come and hear him beg for more money. And they had, and they filled the place in Sophia. They filled the Colosseum there, the, the center. And he left that place rich. He was already rich, but he left richer. And he left poor people even poorer than they were. I tell you, that kind of thing makes me mad, and I can imagine it makes Jesus even madder. I just be great if Jesus could have been there and planted a cord of whips. And, well, I won't go into that. Anyway, so Jesus is incensed about greed. Listen, listen to Mark chapter 7, verses 9 through 12. Still thinking about the Pharisees. Mark 7, 9 through 12. Jesus said to them, you have a fine way. He's talking to the Pharisees. Jesus said, you have a fine way of rejecting the commandment of God in order to establish your own tradition. For Moses said, honor your father and your mother, and whoever reviles father or mother must surely die. In other words, God taught us through the law that we're to take care of our parents. Didn't Caiaphas have a money issue with his parents? Who? Caiaphas. Caiaphas, yeah, no doubt. Uh -huh. And so, but you say, well, if a man tells his father and mother, whatever you would have had from me is Corban. That is, it's devoted to God. I've, I've, I've dedicated it to God. Then you no longer permit him to do anything for his father and mother. See, they had this... Uh, they had this uh, deal where the way you got out of helping your elderly parents is that you took your money, all that you had, you said, well, I've dedicated it to God, so mom and dad, I can't give it to you. I can't, I can't provide for you because I've dedicated my money to God. And Jesus said, that really makes me mad. He said, you're finding a way to twist Scripture with your traditions to get you out of the most basic responsibility that you have. And one other, Luke chapter 20, verses 46 and 47. Luke 20, 46 and 47. Beware of the scribes who like to walk around in long robes, and they love greetings in the marketplace. They love the best seats in the synagogue and the places of honor at the feasts. And they're proud, arrogant people. He said they devour widows' houses, and for a pretense, they make long prayers. They will receive the greater condemnation. Let me just give you a little warning right here. God is not impressed with your <coughs> external religious activities. Amen. God is not impressed with my preaching. You say, well, we're not either, but, uh, <laughs> but I mean, God's not impressed with my preaching. God's not impressed with my activities. God's not impressed with what kind of Bible I carry with me or if I have on my coffee table. God's not impressed with how often I go to church and how loud I sing and things like God's. None of that is what God's looking for. He's looking for a heart that loves him genuinely Amen. and a heart that loves other people sincerely. That's all he's looking for. And he said, you scribes, you Pharisees, you hypocrites, you found ways to take advantage of poor widows and take their houses away from them. And says, your condemnation will be great. I tell you, there's a, 
You don't want to you don't want to mistreat a widow, folks. Because God says, I will be their husband. And I tell you, somebody messes with my wife, hurts her. If I have a strength to do it, I'm going to put a stop to that and put a stop to you if I can, if you're, if you're the one messing and uh, causing harm to my wife. Husbands protect their wives. Widows have a husband. That's God. And God says, you better not mess with those that belong to me. So I'm just telling you, if you're ever going to cheat somebody, cheat a preacher if you want to, but don't cheat a widow. Don't cheat a preacher either, but uh, don't cheat anybody. But if you're gonna if you're gonna take advantage of somebody, don't do it. Don't take advantage of a widow. Okay. Uh, well, got about seven other things here I want to say, but I will just say a couple of them. Uh, what makes Jesus angry? Hypocrisy, power, abusing the weak, religion focusing on money instead of people. Greed, covetousness, no compassion, and then dishonoring the house of God. And by the way, that doesn't mean the church building. I mean, I, I believe in reverence. I believe in, in uh, taking good care of the church building. This is not the house of God. The temple in the Old Testament and in the New Testament times was the place where God met with men in their need of reconciliation. Well, that temple's gone now. Amen. There's no temple anymore. There was a time that God had a temple for his people. Now he has a people for his temple. Amen. We are the temple. Amen. And it's in, in our heart, yes. the Bible says, don't you know that your body is the temple yes. of the Holy Spirit? Amen. And the church together is God's temple today. Yes. And uh, to dishonor God's temple is to dishonor God's name. That's what was happening these people were coming into the place that was supposed to be a place of joyful worship and it was a place of greed. And they were dishonoring the name and the place where God met with men. Mm -hmm. And for us today, for us to profane and abuse <coughs> and not reckon the body of Christ, which is the church. God is angry at that. Do you know that in the book of 1 Corinthians, it tells us people gathering to take the Lord's Supper. He said, there are some of you who are going to die because you are taking the Lord's Supper without regard to the body of Christ. Mm -hmm. Now, obviously, that doesn't happen every time we take the Lord's Supper. But what he's saying is that when we take communion together, we need to rightly de de determine that we're the body of Christ. Yes. And... Uh, God's concerned about his temple. And then they shift the topic. They say, well, what sign are you going to? And he said, here's the sign. You destroy this temple. And he pointed to the temple. And by the way, that temple was destroyed about 40 years later. Totally destroyed. But he said, destroy this temple. This place where men meet with God, 
I'll raise it up in three days. Mm -hmm. They said, how are you going to do that? He said, I, I'm, I'm talking about a different kind of temple. Yes. I'm talking about the temple of my own body, which he was killed and then was raised up in three days. But it, not just his physical body. He raised up a new body, a new temple. And he said, you can tear this temple down, but I'm going to raise up a temple that you can't destroy. Amen. And Jesus said in another place that even the gates of hell will not be able to prevail against the body of Christ, the church. Amen. So, now the second half of my message <laughs> was about the wrath of God. Let me just say that if we understand the holiness of God, we'll begin to understand why there is a need for the wrath of God. And most of us, we, we have very little concept of the holiness of God. In fact, I'm thinking very seriously about on Sunday night, starting in about three weeks, playing a series by Dr. R.C. Sproul called The Holiness of God. It's one of the most powerful studies on the holiness of God that I've ever heard. Every Christian needs to hear it because only as we understand the holiness of God will we understand the wrath of God and the seriousness of sin. There's only one attribute of God that is raised to the third degree. And it's not love, love, love. It's not grace, grace, grace. But it is holy, holy, holy. Yes. And God is angry when we take his holiness yes. and we use it as an excuse for our sin. Amen. But God is gracious. The Lord. And the gospel is this, that all of us have sinned. Yes. You're, we've all sinned. Every one of us have sinned. And all of us are under, were under the judgment of the wrath of God. Amen. And we all deserved it. But God in great love and mercy sent his son who on the cross received the wrath of God for our sin. And all who trust in him, they will never have to face God's wrath. But all those who reject him will face his wrath. Amen. And the Bible tells us of a day in the book of Revelation where Jesus is coming back and the Bible says that the people will hide in the hills and the mountains and the caves and they will say, Hide us from the wrath of the Lamb. The wrath of the Lamb. That's a strange sign. But when Jesus comes back, he's not coming back to be born in a manger. He's not coming back to be nailed to a cross. He's coming back to rule with a rod of iron Amen. and set up a kingdom it will never, ever fail. Amen. You want to be on the winning side, and the winning side is the side that puts its trust in him. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you today for your marvelous grace, but I pray that you will help us never, never, never to let your goodness and your grace and your love and your mercy become an excuse for us to willfully sin and to make money and covetousness and greed the focus of our life. Help us be givers and not takers. Help us to bless others and make that a goal in our life. And I pray that you'll help every person here to put their trust in Jesus alone and live for him. 
For it's in his name we pray. Amen. Amen. We're going to sing a hymn of invitation. I'm going to stand right here at the front. And if you would like to come in some way, if you, if you just want to come and say, Pastor, I need you to pray for me. Maybe you're struggling with uh, a love of money. The Bible says the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. Money itself is not, but the love of money. And uh, maybe you say, Pastor, pray for me. Help me overcome my love for money. And you know the way you do that is by giving. I'm not saying necessarily give to me or to the church even, but give, give. There's so many needs, so many needs. And you don't have to look hard to find them. And if God has blessed you, he has blessed you in order to make you a blessing, not just to give you a blessing. If you need to come in some way, you come as we stand together and as we sing.
is an awesome God. Whenever we're out in the store, somebody, and somebody calls her, they get to hear a little, uh, little uh, concert of our God is an awesome God. Um, I am uh, seriously, we're supposed to finish up the book of Hebrews tonight. And then I'm thinking next Sunday evening, and I'm not trying to get out of preaching because I don't ever get tired of preaching, but I, like on Wednesday nights, we're listening to these messages from Dr. H.B. Charles Jr. Just so good. And some of you got to hear this first one this last week on the doxologies and the benedictions of the Bible. Uh, if you didn't get to hear that, this coming Wednesday night, make sure I, you zoom in and we're, we're zooming it out. If you'll zoom in, you, you, can, you can hear these studies. They're so good. And I, I'm thinking that after we finish the study in Hebrews, I want to let Dr. R.C. Sproul teach us six messages on the holiness of God. And... Uh, We'll do that over Zoom as well. So uh, we'll start that maybe next week. If I finish Hebrews tonight, we'll start that next week. So uh, you really need to hear these messages on the holiness of God. Amen. All right. Well, let's stand together. Have a closing benediction, and then uh, we'll sing a closing song. Our offering box is out in the foyer. And... Uh, and again, I just want to encourage you, don't let your giving be limited to the church. I, obviously, I'm, I, obviously, the church ministry needs funds to operate. But don't, don't think just because you give some money at the church that, that that's all you're giving. No, there are other ministries. There are, there are ministries that you need to give to. There are now, ministries to Israel, Brother John uh, can tell you about some of those. And, that, and, and then there are people. Just, just be on the lookout. And if you find somebody that has a need, you, you help them. And it's a gift. And uh, so giving is God's way of that's, that's our way of loving. That's God's way of loving. He loved us and he gave. We love and we give. So that's sermonette number two. Okay, so uh, let's pray and then we'll have our closing song. Father, generous Father, you've been so good to us. You've just lavished us. You, your word tells you, you've lavished us with your grace. Yes. Help us be givers.
like that song too. I'll surprise. Okay. He's had a lot of songs redone. Yeah. 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 Yeah.